entrepreneurs, uh, fellow entrepreneurs, if you will. Uh, if I sort of just summarize uh, the introduction, it seems like uh, many of, uh, there seem like two buckets, right? There's many of you who are sort of mobile entrepreneurs, wanting to build mobile services. The other set of people, probably a bigger group, is people who just want to use mobile to make their existing businesses better. Uh, there's a couple of students, budding entrepreneurs, and one person using big words like ontological modeling and so on. So, uh, just kidding. Uh, but, but I think, so, you know, I've, uh, it's a little, it was a little hard to prepare uh, for, uh, you know, for such a diverse audience, right? So what I'm going to do is try, you know, at least in the beginning, stay at somewhat at a high level, just share some of the broader mobile trends that are happening. Why is it important? Why is it significant? Why is it perhaps the most transformational thing you know, that's going on right now? And then uh, in, the, in the second part, I'm going to make it a little more tactical, pragmatic, specific. Right? If some people want tools or specific things that they can do or next steps, uh, hopefully just a few uh, pointers that can point you in some direction. And then uh, let's have a QA uh, part as well. In fact, not just at the end, please, uh, please, feel, uh, please feel free to stop me or ask questions or, uh, you know, Deeper. Many of the answers actually may just come from this audience itself. Some of you already uh, may be working on certain things, mobile payments or what have you, right? So, okay, so let's just uh, get started. Uh, you know, in case you haven't had a chance to read my background a little bit, I'm mean, I, I born and brought up here in Mumbai, uh, IIT Mumbai, then went to grad school uh, in the US, uh, MIT, then I was on Wall Street. I previously started another company called Elance uh, that was back in the late 90s. Well, it's the largest online freelance marketplace. Uh, and I left that about six, seven years ago and then started uh, this company, officially called Webaru, but we use the top shop brand in India just because you know, it sounds better. Right? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so that's been my entrepreneurial journey at least. Um, also, I should say, yeah, I spent about 20 years in the US, most of it in Silicon Valley, uh, until I moved back, relocated here about uh, three years ago now. And uh, my wife got tired of my of me commuting from Silicon Valley to Mumbai. It's, uh, it's a very long way off. Here, so. Anyway, so that uh, brings me to here and now. Um, and you know, I've been uh, just as an entrepreneur, I'm just uh, uh, fascinated or excited about opportunities that can, you know, really big opportunities, right? Things that can affect billions of people, that can transform lots and lots of people in life. So I think uh, when I started Elance. Right, the vision was uh, enabling. I mean, there's there's billions of talented people worldwide, uh, many of whom don't get enough work or good work. And by creating a freelancer marketplace, people can connect with other people and, and work with each other. And today, it does about a billion dollars worth of transaction volume. Uh, and you know, uh, the, the the whole space is about 500 billion dollars worth of staffing. So. Even if you know it has, if it reaches 10% penetration, 20% penetration, I mean, these are still really, really big numbers. So that you know that was sort of uh, very exciting. I mean, that was the first way you when know, the internet happened. Uh, you know, internet was all about connecting people, and then you know, they, you know uh, that's what Elance also did. But uh, after the internet, it, you know, um, as you guys know, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, something even more transformational happened, right? When the mobile revolution happened. Uh, it was much more significant in, in many ways, right? So for example, if you think about the, the PC-based internet, it remained mostly a Western phenomenon, US, Europe mostly, uh, partly because you know an average computer costs like $500,000, fairly expensive, uh, broadband was expensive, connectivity was expensive, etc. And therefore it just remained mostly a, a Western phenomenon. And it transformed all those economies, but it didn't touch or didn't impact the rest of the world nearly as much. And I think when mobile came about, uh, apart from the leaving aside the technical aspects of it, right, the fact that you would get you know, a $50 device, you know, $3,000, $5,000 uh, rupee device that you can connect to the internet and do things with it, suddenly made the internet much more accessible. right? So even today, the, the PC internet is about 2 billion users, the mobile uh, platform is, reaches about five to six billion users, right? And that uh, difference is very stark in countries like India, right? We have uh, maybe about 100, 120 million sort of internet users, but as you know, six, seven hundred million mobile users. And uh, so that was the first wave of revolution, right? Uh, uh, 
the, the operators, feature phones, mostly SMS based and so on. And now we are literally, you know, 2014 is an inflection point. It's a, it's a big, big year for the second mobile revolution, right? In India, there are about, what are they, 85 million mobile internet users, right? Smartphone, uh, smartphone users connected with data and so on. And by the end of the year, it's going to be over 200 million users, okay? And up to 2015, and maybe even 350 or so. so. This is massive, okay? It's like, think about it, right? Never in the history of our country have we had so many people even connected to each other, right? I mean, TV doesn't reach that many people, print doesn't reach that many people, you know, so, and it has huge effects, right? Social effect, political effect, how people vote, who they elect. I mean, when you don't know, when you're not informed, you make different kinds of choices. So mobile, you know, just impacts every part of life. It impacts business, impacts society, impacts politics, um, everything. So, so I think, you know, so partly it's a huge global trend, and then even India, you know, mobile revolution one and two, I mean, I'll sort of broadly sort of discuss it uh, with, with these, these, these themes, okay? So let's take uh, sort of the first revolution, right? I mean, when I, uh, when I started Webinar and Gapshap again, when I, when I looked at it, it was just amazing that you had nearly a billion sort of mobile users, right, in a country like India. Um, unfortunately, they all have, and I say unfortunately relatively, meaning unfortunately they had all, all had just feature forms where all you can do is just voice and SMS. Right? There's no other way to send information to, no other way to reach all these users. So that's when we sort of built a, a bunch of SMS-based services. But in the first wave, it was really just, that was the only way to communicate, to reach all these users. And I'll talk a little bit about SMS marketing. And we do that, but I, you know, I don't want to make this talk focus more about Gapsha, our, our own products. I'll talk about a lot of lot of different companies and products as well. But at least in India and SMS, I mean, there aren't too many choices, really, you, you know. So certainly, uh, SMS-based marketing uh, has, has been the only way to reach millions of feature phones, millions of handsets, uh, mobile users. So whether it's doing targeted campaigns or, uh, you know, profile-based campaigns, uh, and, and whether it's promotional or transactional. <coughs> For those of you in financial services, I mean, virtually every financial transaction has to have an SMS confirmation that goes with it. I mean, that's required by, by law and so on. But many other businesses, e-commerce companies, you know, travel agencies, I mean, a lot of people use SMS to communicate, uh, to send notifications and so on. So I think, uh, you know, people almost expect, I mean, if they do a transaction, they expect a verification, they expect to receive, you know, I use Ola Cab, it sends me the receipt by SMS, you know, I use, uh, you go to a store, you buy a shop for, you book my show or something, you get a ticket, SMS verification, you do a banking transaction. Before I sign the receipt, I get the SMS as well and so on. So a lot of that, you know, I mean, those are what's called transactional. When you do a specific transaction. There's a lot of promotional stuff as well. Some of it is junk, uh, unsolicited, uh, but, but a lot of it is useful, a lot of it is interesting. Obviously, it has conversion rates, and that's why people continue to use it. And, you know, some of you may be aware we offer these services as well, uh, but uh, that was that was all you know in the uh, in the first mobile revolution, if you will. And right now, I think the more exciting thing, I think the, the thing that anybody in this room you cannot afford to ignore is just what's happening with uh, with smartphones, with data, uh, with apps, uh, and uh, and that whole ecosystem. Right? If you think about it. Uh, in the first wave, the operators controlled everything, right? The operator uh, would control uh, what services were possible, what value-added services, or gas, as they call it, right? If you want to buy ringtone, you want to buy music, Bollywood, things like that. It was all provided by the operator deck, if you will, the operator promoted bass services, and so on. Um, in many cases, they also controlled devices, because devices could only be bought only operator certified devices can be bought. Less so in India, but in other countries, they used to control everything. And uh, I think with hindsight, it's very clear that the operators completely screwed it up. Okay, it was for those of you in the mobile space, you know, it was it's uh, virtually it, it's extremely difficult to work with operators. You know, it, they were they were just a slightly better version of the of the Indian bureaucracy. Okay, where uh, you have multiple meetings, long waits, you plead, beg all kinds of things and then maybe they'll do something which is in their interest anyway which makes them a lot of money too but you know they act like they're doing you a favor well the problem is you know 
Silicon Valley companies, guys like Apple, Google, and so on, they just say, this is nonsense. There's a better way. You just create an open platform where any developer with an idea can, can build a service and offer it through the platform, right? So they seized control of the device and of the platform away from the operators. Uh, they created these very open operating systems, right? iOS or Android, uh, which BlackBerry failed to do, uh, Nokia failed to do, right? It's sort of, uh, strangely, these sort of ideas only seem to come out of Silicon Valley, uh, but not outside, because you realize that once you create an open ecosystem where any, you know, any developer, any budding entrepreneur can just create an app, and you don't need to go visit them in Silicon Valley, have dozen meetings, plead with them, show some, you know, a list of documents, any of that. I mean, you just you just create it and you're good to go. And if it works and your customers like it, it, it flies. And if it's not, it doesn't, right? So open, transparent ecosystem with very open rules, no negotiation, <coughs> nothing like that. So that's transforming, uh, you know, transformed it in many, many ways, right? The devices became <coughs> richer and more attractive. Uh, they became more, they're, they're almost like a mini computer in your hand. It's not a phone, it's really a computer. Uh, and it's more compu more powerful than the computers, you know, I was using or we were all using a decade ago. So quite quite amazing, and that the app ecosystem also opened up where anybody can can create an app, put it up there, and so on. So I think as we uh, as we look at it, you know, uh, here and now, uh, I think the the, the smartphone uh, smartphones are coming. Like I said, many people are adopting it. Data is going to become more and more uh, prevalent. Uh, data plans are becoming cheaper as well. Uh, hopefully, we'll get unlimited data plans as well at some point. In the, Operators uh, support that, but the rest of the innovation is all happening through, through mobile apps, and uh, the operators are not the gatekeeper anymore. Nobody cares what Airtel or Voda or Reliance is offering. They're just what's called a dump pipe, as in they're just a they're just a messaging pipe over which whatever you want to do it comes from the app stores, it comes from other places, and so on. So you know, I think this is uh, this is lowering <coughs> device prices, it's lowering data plan prices, it's driving more innovation, it's creating more apps and services, so suddenly, right, uh, I mean, previously you only had access to what the operator, what Airtel decided to give you, or what some Indian entrepreneur wanted to, you know, build and offer through Airtel. In this new world, now, you know, you don't, it's what uh, a global ecosystem is now accessible, just one click away, right, you go to the Play Store or the iOS App Store, any global, somebody in Brazil or Turkey may have created a phenomenal app that you're not even aware of, but could dramatically improve your business. Well, guess what, it's just one click away, right? Um, it could be, you know, somebody here may be charging a lot, but there's a free service or a better service or a more, uh, a better design tool, uh, suddenly that's accessible, right? So, and, and, and vice versa, even for offering your services or if apps that you're building, you don't need to target just an Indian market anymore. You have a global market that's equally accessible. Because once you put it there, um, people anywhere in the world have access to it. Okay, so this forces all of us to kind of become much more global, you know, in terms of things we buy or use, as well as in terms of things we sell. Uh, because you know, you're, 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 not, you're not restricted to a narrow <coughs> closed ecosystem or a domestic or a local ecosystem, we are now, we're just all part of the same global ecosystem. And that's uh, that's a big, big change, right? So suddenly when you think about business practices, okay, if you have global tools, you can operate at a global scale, or at least in the best practice way globally, right? You can suddenly adopt many new methods, techniques, processes, um, tools, uh, price points that, that the best in the world may be doing, you're not, you know, you don't have to stay restricted to just what's available here and now. So it's just really, really uh, transformational, right? I think so. So that's the, uh, <coughs> you know, that's the general theme uh, that uh, that I wanted to emphasize, which is uh, it's just such a transformational thing that no matter what you're doing, no matter which business you're in, whether in the mobile business or not in the mobile business, just want to use mobile for your existing businesses. I mean, uh, this is easily the most you know, transformational technology uh, that, uh, of our times here. So, okay, so I think the, 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 that was a general theme. Let me, uh, does that, let me pause there for a second. Does that make sense, yeah. at least at a high level? Yeah. Interesting, any questions, yeah. comments? <coughs> yeah. As we, as we discuss about the application, 
but still i think uh, uh, in application mode we hardly download the application correct right only except we got something sms somewhere to download this bill or we go to top free is not that we don't know pay but we don't know right so can you as a you are uh, as company like yours you are you are pioneers in this uh, sml at least we know something about so this new application come which is helpful to you right because today don't mind to paying but we don't know which right. application to download and how is used to us right so i think only that's thing a, we yes yeah. that's a that's a good point right see uh, what you're saying is discovery discovery of apps is really hard right. and and that's true though i think it will improve okay um, let me explain right if you go back to the mid 90s when the internet came about okay uh, at first there were like whatever a dozen websites mostly in colleges and universities right and then more and more people <coughs> so then there were like hundreds and thousands of websites right so yahoo right uh, a budding entrepreneur started a company called yahoo uh, whose job was to uh, organize the web so he created a whole directory where if you want real estate if you want sports you want business you want technology there are different links to different websites um, and you know for those who may not know the name yahoo itself the name came from uh, yet, yet another hierarchically organized ontology like the ontology and so on uh, which is just all it means is it's a directory right a directory of websites so when there were 1000 websites or 10000 websites you could organize everything and then the explosion happened right then you got to millions of websites and then you got to hundreds of millions and billions of websites well that's when another budding entrepreneur created google which then became a search engine which then drew discovery you type in a keyword you find whatever you want and you can use it okay when you come to mobile and mobile apps unfortunately the discovery is much harder okay um for a variety of reasons uh, well apple certainly doesn't want google to create the search engine for apps right so one is they want to retain that control but a even harder problem is see if you know um, you know organizing web pages or indexing web pages was easier because they have something called the page rank hyperlinks which allow you to create a page rank when you when you try to index apps you don't know anything about an app right all you have is the description but there may be 10 apps which say the same thing and you don't know which one is better right yeah you do have some ratings but some are paid some are free and it's not quite easy i mean to build an algorithm to allow a discovery so i think fair right i i agree with you the discovery of apps is harder and in fact what that means by the way right is uh, most users are not going to download a lot of apps okay you just have to assume websites has what's called a very long tail meaning even small websites get enough traffic because if you're focused on you know if you focused on providing one very specific thing right like say artificial flowers in andheri for example and you somebody puts that keyword in google you still find the website you'll get the traffic you can buy but if you have an app that's doing something very very small it's virtually impossible that anybody will ever download it because first the discovery is hard and secondly download is a is a barrier okay so i might even say i mean um, you know not to sound discouraging but the reality is obscure niche apps are going to have a very very tough time getting any traffic okay where you are actually better off not building an app unless you think that either there is a core audience that's really really loyal and they jump through hoops to find discover and use your app or don't do the app I and mean, you're better off putting it you know promoting it through through facebook twitter and other things and through existing media because because nobody's going to download uh, obscure apps i mean it just not going to happen okay so uh, for example there's a lot of businesses that come and say oh you know i have a i have a website i also want to create a mobile app my customer i want to tell my customers to download my mobile app and so on and yeah that's fine it looks it may help your ego to have your own app but it's very unlikely that you know most users will download the app so it's it may just be a waste of time in general okay there may be specific instances where it has worked but, but it's certainly harder than a website I mean, it's okay to have a website but it's it's harder to have an app uh, for any business. But have you ever seen any uh, find some solution to this? No, I think the okay. The, so the, the solution actually just depends on the the product that you're building. Okay, if you're building a product that really adds a lot of value to a user, and sometimes either and there's a good way to promote it, meaning it's it may be viral, 
right? Think about how WhatsApp and others spread. They don't do any advertising, but they spread because your friends tell you about it and you download it, and then you have a lot of fun with it. So it's inherently viral, as in once one person uses it, others get to know about it and they use it as well, right? Uh, I mean, uh, Facebook and so on were already big on the web as well, but even let's say, you know, if it's gaming, certain games, I mean, it's very hit or miss, really. It's like a little bit like Bollywood movies, you know. So Candy Crush is huge and, you know, they may even IPO soon, but there are many, 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 many games that are either never see the light of day or are very trendy. So, so the answer is, if, you, if you're building an app, first ask what is it that you're building, and is it who is it valuable to, and how valuable is it to them, right? For example, is it a, is, as they call it, is it a painkiller or a vitamin, right? For a guy with a headache, you give them a painkiller, they'll say, okay, whatever the price, I need it and I need it now. But if you give somebody a vitamin, say, hey, let make you stronger and better after 10 years, the guy will say, okay, talk to me tomorrow, you know, and never happen. So, so the answer, I mean, it just starts with what is the product and who is it valuable <coughs> for and how valuable is it and will they be, and is it good enough that they'll tell their friends. Uh, so it really pushes, it puts even more pressure on product design and product development uh, where only really good products will survive and grow. Uh, but many others will just fall to the wayside. So I'm, I mean, I, it's not a specific answer. I mean, it depends. Yeah, no, but uh, my, my, I, uh, uh, it's not don't you feel your company like your government will play a major role into the viral this uh, uh, applications? No. Why your system? <laughs> maybe. Sure. Let me sure. yes, answer this. I mean, I have some knowledge on this particular aspect of it. So I know of uh, almost a dozen companies who are building apps which help you discover apps. Right. So, oh. so there, there, something like in the Yahoo model. So there right. are companies who are building apps, which uh, uh, you know start suggesting you have based on your behavioral skills. For example, if you're st he knows that you are sitting in this part of this town, you know what type of traffic is there in this place and start suggesting you apps which can help you navigate the traffic better. Or if you're going to visiting a zoo, it, by geographical coordinates, uh, it knows that you're visiting a zoo, it will tell you the app that you can use to ward off mosquitoes, for example. So there are, there are apps which are being built up which will help you discover apps. So I, I'm sure in the next two, three months' time, we'll all see such apps coming up. Yeah, I think if I just build on that, there are many uh, app marketing tools and platforms, right? And just uh, an example of what he just said, there's something called App A Day. <coughs> Every day it recommends a new app uh, to millions of people, okay? Uh, so, but they charge you, of course, right? And then there are app marketplaces, uh, there are ad marketplaces, there are real-time bidding exchanges. There's a lot of mobile app marketing that you can do. Uh, but what it all boils down to is a lot of these are traded on a cost per install. They charge you for every installation. So it's either cost per click or cost per install. And uh, these these rates are becoming very high okay, as well, partly because what happens is, say, you know, sites like, uh, I mean, apps like WeChat and Kakao and Line, they spend a ton of money. So they bid up the rates. And then if you're, uh, you know, so sometimes it's as much as a, as a dollar per install, two dollars per install, and so on. Which is very expensive, right? So imagine you're, you're paying 50 rupees or 100 rupees just to get an installation. Then the question is, how much are you going to monetize? Will you ever make 100 rupees per user to recover the investment you made in acquiring that user? So, so yes, there are a lot of tools, but they're also very expensive. So, so that's why I come back to well, and then the only free tools are a really good product with with viral features. Okay. So, and. Uh, yeah, so I mean, companies like us, I mean, we do that too, but ultimately our, our service is also based on market prices for advertising, right? So certainly, uh, I mean, SMS is one way, at least in India to this day. So anyway, let's keep going. Uh, so I think, uh, so let, let me switch gears a little bit. I wanted to uh, get to the second part. Yes. I have a question before you move on from global aspect. From what aspect? From global aspect, yeah. to specific one. When we are looking at a product and I want to launch it globally, see so on internet product can be global the moment I launch it. I, I don't have to do any extra efforts. But the moment I start getting traffic from other countries, will it create regulatory issues for me to really solve these issues? And suppose I get a, a launch a product and, and I get revenue on this from another country. So I mean look for the most part no. But this is an evolving framework, right? I mean, we are getting into a global world. These days, when you get revenue, it's really just Google paying you. 
it's not like somebody in Brazil or somebody in Turkey or somebody somewhere is paying you. It's really just Google paying, let's say Google Play Store is paying you for a certain fee. And Google is in India and there's, there's no taxation issues yet. Okay, but over time we don't know. I mean, I think the, you know, the rules may change uh, as well. But I won't, honestly, just don't worry about it. I mean, just, yeah, it's, it's a brave new world. Uh, these things are outside your control, they'll sort yourself, they'll sort themselves out, but I would just gonna go ahead with it. But anyway, let me, uh, what I wanted to do was, you know, <coughs> just looking at a, a bunch of tools that, for example, that I use, or uh, that friends I have, or also looking at some online reviews and so on, just wanted to share a few sort of specific things or pragmatic things that, uh, that, that you can use, and these are, these are things that are popularly, you know, almost any business, these are, uh, these are things that they, they, they want to use. So I think if you, if you think about businesses, right, there's two sets of, uh, I mean, mobile as a platform, uh, they, can, they can use it to interact with, uh, uh, externally, with their customers, with their distributors, with their agents, with their sales channel, and so on. And the other is internally, with employees, or even with their own business productivity, uh, their own conversation, you know, internal business operations, if you will. Okay, so if you look at it broadly under, uh, under those two things, I think, uh, and I'm just going to refer to some notes here as well. So, I think as far as uh, customer communication is concerned, I mean, at, at least on a global scale, uh, you know, like I was saying, it'd be hard to kind of create your own app. I don't think that sort of approach is going to work unless it's an exceptionally good app or something. But, you know, just reliance on social media is really the best way uh, to, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and things like that. I mean, just make sure your businesses are well represented, your business identities are well created, well represented um, on, on all these social media. And in fact, there are tools as well as apps uh, that allow you to manage. I mean, even social media is expanding. There's so many different varieties of, of social networks, if you will. Uh, so one uh, tool in particular, Hootsuite, uh, if you've heard of it, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. Uh, Hootsuite is sort of one of the leading, it's called social media management tool, which <coughs> one single place or maybe one single app, they have a mobile version too, using which you can manage, you can post simultaneously to Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, uh, to, to other networks as well. H-O-O-T, S-O-O-T, Suite, S-U-I-T-E. Yeah. Um, there are many others, I'm just, just use that as an example, okay, and uh, and I, I have no particular affiliation with any of these uh, products except the ones that I'll clarify. So these are just uh, just pointers. But there are many other, there's a dozen other companies that do that for social media management, which just makes your life easier. But I think at least you know, from a business standpoint, it's important new products, new deals, new offers, or, or even just uh, you know things, uh, uh, even just your, in many cases, maybe your own thoughts and opinions, it allows you to take thought leadership in your space. And um, also when customers respond, uh, having the ability to manage, uh, you know, it almost becomes a customer relationship management tool. So, so my recommendation is, I mean, more than so creating your own app, you're just better off using these tools to more effectively manage those customer relationships, uh, using apps that customers already have, right? You don't need to uh, sort of create your own one. I think uh, even, a, uh, of course, uh, I don't know, for recruiting and so on, I mean, LinkedIn is just incredibly uh, powerful. It's almost transforming the way companies even recruit people where, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys have used this, I mean, we use it a lot as well. But before you even approach a candidate, you, you know everything about the candidate. You even know, you know, common friends or common relations and therefore what's the best way. It doesn't even feel like a recruiting call if your friend is calling. Right, as opposed to the head of HR calling and so on and so forth. So I think it makes a has a huge impact, and uh, I mean all, all of these have uh, good good apps as well. In fact, uh, in particular, LinkedIn has a tool called uh, you know. So for those of you who have uh, the same problem I do oftentimes, which is I get a ton of business cards. Right, you go to events like these, and then you end up with dozens of business cards, sometimes hundreds of business cards uh, after a conference, and it's hard uh, to, to capture all of it. And sometimes you lose them and so on. So there are these. Uh, fantastic tools where you can just take a picture of the card and it just automatically files it or indexes it uh, in your contact book, right? Um, or in some cases, uh, so LinkedIn has a tool called Card Munch, which just 
you can take a photo of the card and it initiates, it connects you on LinkedIn already with that person, right? So suddenly, not only have you gotten the card information, but also built a relationship and a network online. Um, or um, I think Business Card Pro, if I'm not mistaken, is, a, is another good tool. I mean, that just standalone, you just puts it into your contact. You may not want to make a LinkedIn relationship with that person, but you know, at least uh, just managing business cards, which is important for networking and so on, is uh, <coughs> you know, I think it's just much better than carrying around old style scanners, you know, putting in cards and so on and so forth. So things have become a lot better. I think uh, on a in in India, I think I've seen uh, talking about external customer communication. You know, certainly SMS has been a big part, I and mean, that's where we do offer services, but now social media is becoming more and more prevalent and a better way to reach it. it. It is a little hard though, I mean you have to be, you know, you can't just be broadcasting ads to people, you do, you know, it's a, it's a change in mindset, you almost have to have a conversation with people, even with people who may be abusing you or they may be complaining about your product and, and doing it publicly, right, which, is, which can be very challenging for any business. Uh, but think of each one of those as an opportunity to convert uh, a problem customer into an evangelist, right? By uh, give them a voucher, give them a discount, or fix the problem, or in fact, first and foremost, admit the problem, right? Many businesses get very defensive by saying, no, 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 everything was fine, we didn't make a mistake, you made a mistake. Well, you know, the customer's always right. I mean, the customer can't ever make a mistake, right? So even if you're right, you're better off just sort of saying, okay, fine, you know, uh, sorry, you know, we regret that this happened to you, and we'll just flip it around and so on, but I think that's, that shift in mindset is very, very essential uh, because mobile and social media in particular amplifies everything, right? So one conversation with com one customer is now visible to millions of people uh, and indexed forever, which means nobody, the internet never forgets, right? Anything that happens out there is accessible and visible. Um, I think uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of internal tools, there's uh, so let's say for uh, just productivity, okay, uh, a lot of us are out and about, you know, the only thing we have with us is, is our mobile phones and so on. So I don't know if you've used Evernote, uh, which is a note-taking tool, and certainly uh, incredibly powerful, incredibly uh, popular, right? You can, you can take quick notes, ideas, thoughts, what have you, business notes, uh, but it's then synced online, and you can also share it with other people and so on. So uh, there, were, there were a lot of, clever features uh, and so on. So it's certainly doing very well, very popular, and uh, certainly one of the best uh, things out there. I think uh, in terms of travel, I don't know if you guys uh, use this a lot for fly flight tracking. And if, there's quite a few tools actually, but flight track is one of those. Uh, uh, in the US it'd be Uber, but out here Ola also has apps that have been convenient for booking taxis and, and tracking what's where, delayed, which gate, uh, which places uh, to go to. I mean, that's often a big, a big problem. Uh, for task and project management, I don't know if you guys use that often as well. Uh, you know, good services, Asana, E-S-A-N-A, -A, or I think the pronunciation is different uh, in the US, but uh, uh, it's, it's a simpler version of, of tasks and projects, and shared tasks and projects for teams, and so on, that, uh, that works uh, Works very very well. Um, I think uh, then for internal communication, there's a few things I wanted to talk about. So um, certainly, you know, you guys may, may have used Skype and WebEx and Google Hangouts, and there are many of these new ones coming as well. Uh, there's been a new wave of uh, apps as well. If you've heard of Yammer, uh, Yammer is almost like a Facebook, uh, but for corporate communications, right? Um, so Yammer is also, you know started about six, seven years ago, and then Microsoft recently bought it uh, uh, for a billion dollars or something. But basically what they do is because on the consumer side, everybody is used to Facebook and they understand how it works. Inside the company, you can create a Facebook version. And um, based on email, it, it checks who's, who are all the people in a particular company. And then uh, people can create their profiles and share updates and so on and communicate. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one tool. Uh, you know, and another tool, this one I'll sort of, uh, this is a tool that uh, we've launched. It's a tool called Team Chat. Uh, this is like a WhatsApp for the enterprise. So if you think of Yammer as the Facebook for the enterprise, uh, Team Chat is WhatsApp for the enterprise, you know. Um, 
what's happening is people use, everybody uses WhatsApp, right? I'm sure everyone here uses online or <coughs> chat or account. They work great for friends and family, but they don't work for businesses because they're limited by group size to 50 people. And suppose if you have hundreds of employees, thousands of employees in the field, and sometimes resellers, distributors, agents, you can't create a WhatsApp group, right? Uh, and the reason why you can't do WhatsApp doesn't allow that actually is because if you have too many people, it becomes very cluttered and very noisy. Okay, uh, too many messages. Uh, if you if you are in any family groups, you already know. So, uh, so what we've done is we figured out a clever way of summarizing uh, these messages. And once you summarize the messages, then you can allow unlimited group size. To give you a specific example, you send a message saying, you know, how much sales did you do today? Okay. And uh, when people reply uh, with, with their numbers, let's say 10, 20, 30, it just adds up the total. So you see the total right there. The same message updates itself. Uh, it sees the total. And then one link away, you can see all the details as well. So the point is, you know, you get the answer right there. And it's just one message. And it doesn't create, even if 500 people or 5,000 people reply, uh, it doesn't create more messages. It just stays as one message. And these are all flexible, customizable. So it could be different things. You could do survey or poll or other kinds of things. So anyway, we're talking to banks and so on, or financial services, which have huge distributors. So they can have a lakh people or 50,000 people. They can all sort of communicate very effectively. So your product, the UK? Yeah, so this one is, this one is ours. Um, and we just launched it a couple of weeks ago. So we were talking about, yeah, you should. I mean, I'd love feedback. Yeah, it's a way of dividing the market. Yeah. Beam check. Beam check. Yeah. Is it a free version or is it a paid? Uh, okay. Uh, so it's a what's called a freemium, as in the basic app is free. Okay. Uh, but there's an admin panel that allows you more advanced features for tracking data and so on. So that will be uh, one to two dollars per user per month. Okay. But right now in the early stages, it'll be very flexible. So this so information available on your website. I yeah, it's so on teamchat.com. Team Okay, um, in terms of travel uh, expenses and uh, expense tracking, always a big problem, uh, you know, I mean it depends, if, you, if it's your own business, you may not care, but uh, even then, just for tracking and so on, uh, there is one tool I've used uh, and I like, uh, Expensify, it's just a very simple, I mean, you can even just take photos of receipts and so on, so you can make it, you know, cut the paperwork and it just automatically uh, makes it a lot easier for you to, you to track and such. So I think this was, uh, these were a, a few tools that I had looked at. Um, let me also throw it out to you guys. Any, any tools that you guys particularly like for your own business, productivity, enhancements? What do you have on your devices here? Yeah. Google Keep. Yeah. Google Keep. Google Keep. What's that? Yeah. OK. Traffic sure. line. So it just goes. Traffic line. Traffic line. Gives Tra you traffic maps. Traffic. I think but Google Maps has that too. There's a better service called Waze, which actually was acquired by Google. Uh, W-A-Z-E, Waze. Uh, and uh, what they do is uh, very interesting, right? It's, uh, it's crowdsourced traffic map, which means uh, you know everybody downloads, all, the, all their users have downloaded their app. And then the app is tracking how fast you're moving in a car or on a particular road. And based on all that information, so everybody's providing real-time traffic information to to the company, which is then sharing it with everyone else. Waze. W A Z E. Waze. Don't bother using that right now because I took you users right uh, on Waze. It's mostly popular in Silicon Valley and in Israel. Yeah. So it's an Israeli company. So more in the U.S. and Israel. I think India has fewer well, users. So there is another app, M, M Indicator, which That's gives true. you information about the train and. Uh, That's true. So in Mumbai, I hear M Indicator is extremely popular. In fact, they're in a Thai boot camp. I've been working with them a little bit. Uh, it's interesting. There are 55 lakh downloads. Uh, and you know, it's, it's huge usage in India. So anybody using local trains and such, it's, you have the whole timetable. Yeah. But unfortunately, it's just, it just the timetable. It doesn't have any changes. Yeah. Like, is the train running late? Well, you won't know that. You know. Uh, so, but, but, but still, I mean, it's still useful. In fact, if there are budding entrepreneurs here, the thing I would suggest, okay, this is a perfect example, okay, of uh, things that a lot of people need, and they need it critically, right? Every day in the morning, you're running late, hey, when's the next train, I'm going to miss this one, when's the next one? And uh, I don't know, previously, you'd have to carry around paper timetables, and they just put it in an app, and just made it easily available. It's just incredibly powerful, right? So if you think about it, 
I mean, yeah, you know, all the things that uh, in, in India that information is so hard to get, and if an app can provide it instantly or quickly, you know, even better would be is the train running late, uh, you know, or maybe on a map you can actually see where the train is, how far it is, or something. Uh, you know, maybe education, right? If you could get all the content in an app, you know, maybe all the question banks that people carry around or uh, or textbooks or things like that. I think students would probably love that. Uh, but these are some good examples of niche apps that that can work because the need is so great for the among the people that want to use it that uh, it's, it's easily one of the most popular apps in Mumbai. There is one called uh, App Lock on the Android Store where you can App Lock. You can uh, specifically locks, uh, you know, have a lock screen for different apps that you don't want public. So like right. your SMS inbox. Mm -hmm. So you can choose. Uh, this is my uh, uh, this this particular app. Has so so you don't want your wife to read it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 There's a very interesting app which is developed. Uh, it's known as Flight Radar 24 in which real-time flights, you can actually see them real-time moving. Right. That, that is uh, actually done with the, uh, the technical thing known as ADSB adapters. Right, right. Through that, uh, you can get real-time information on the Excellent. heading, then actually uh, right. the altitude and all these things. Or is it's for an uh, aviation enthusiast. Right. You can actually track flight radar 24. Moreover, uh, from my uh, place, I'm more of an aviation enthusiast. So from my place, I actually broadcast this data for uh, from uh, Prabhadevi area till uh, the 660 nautical miles from Prabhadevi. So that's the way I uh, broadcast this data for this time. Right. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, let's just, uh, if there are other uh, comments or questions or conversations, I mean, let's just have a, have a discussion on, uh, you know, what are what are problems you're facing or what are, what are challenges you guys are thinking about, I mean, what should, uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, is this focused on mobile or can, in general, about question about business? Uh, you know, I think that's fine, but let's, let's stay. Okay, why don't you ask the question? If it yeah, I'm sure. Out. So, it's, uh, should, uh, should a company focus on services or products or can it do both if it really wants to do both? Okay. <laughs> so certainly not mobile. Uh, and I'll just quickly come, I, I think it's hard to do both. The employees get confused. You would get confused. Uh, I think it's really hard. Yeah. So uh, you just said that uh, there's so many uh, uh, smartphone users and the number increasing every year. So how do you see the trend of uh, SMS, the traditional SMS marketing? So the funny thing is, right? Uh, SMS usage actually continues to grow, and not just in India, but even in countries like US and so on, where uh, partly because just the basic mobile usage is growing, or people's mobile sophistication is growing, it continues to grow. But it certainly has lost its sex appeal, so to speak, right? Because right. smartphones and IP messaging and WhatsApp and so on, it's it's moving. So I think the way that there are some charts that talk about it, but you know, SMS continues to grow, but IP messaging is going to grow faster and cross over. Okay, so so it's not an either or. I think if you're a business I and mean, you really you know, just a means to an end whether your message goes through SMS or it goes through an IP message, uh, it doesn't matter so long as the message actually reaches. So is uh, Bakshat also thinking about uh, building something for IP messaging? I mean, the answer is yes. What we do, we also have another tool which sends messages into WhatsApp. Because people already have WhatsApp and they can it. And can we just deliver, it's not delivering it through SMS, can we deliver it? And we have, we have set it up. The reason why we haven't popularized it too much is uh, WhatsApp itself limits, you know, they don't want unsolicited messages, okay? Right. So if you try to send a message to a person who doesn't have you in their contact book, it won't go through, or rather only, only a few will go through and more won't, right? So the right way to actually do it, and, and this is something we can help with, uh, this is something we offer, the right way to do it is, let's say, send uh, invitations by SMS, saying, please add us to WhatsApp, okay? And then, you know, send us a message, it's almost like an opt-in, right? So if they send you a message, after that, then you can send automatic messages to all of them. Uh, so, so you have to convince them to opt-in to receive messages from you. But once they do that, then then you can send unlimited WhatsApp messages, which can dramatically cut your marketing cost or SMS marketing cost. So that's something you should absolutely look at. Right? Yes. Would like to touch upon the security issues using social media apps, um, data security, your own security. Sure. 
Okay, but, but with social media or in general? Because see, social I mean, media in particular. But see, social media is inherently content that's shared outside, right? So, I mean, security is more for internal tools. But let's say, but let's say, uh, yeah, sending messages on Facebook, Twitter, and so on. I mean, uh, mm. security is in, is less of a concern there because you, you want it to be read by everybody and shared with everyone. But for uh, for your internal communication, so let's say, for example, uh, you know. In fact, so I'll just take the specific example of Team Chat, right? I've been talking to at least 40, 50 companies. Many of those people say, we want to keep the messages and the content inside our company. They don't want to go through our servers. Like say today, if you have a WhatsApp group, the messages are flowing through external servers, and uh, you don't know who else has access to it and, and so on. Not only that, uh, if the employee leaves and goes to a competitor, there's nothing you can do. They're still in that WhatsApp group, and unless person who created the group remembers to delete them, they may continue to receive messages and so on. So I think for many enterprise tools, at least in TeamChat what we're doing is one will set up a mechanism where they can, a company, a large company can host its own server. So the messages just stay in their system and inside their firewall, their VPN and so on. And um, uh, you know, so, so it just uh, stays there. Also secondly, the admin panel allows you to remove users and so on. So most tools like this uh, would, I think Yammer as well, would allow you to delete a user who's, who's left or control uh, the, the, the data. But, but yeah, every, every app that you use for mission critical stuff, I mean, if it's expense management and so on, it's less of an issue. But if it's proprietary business information, you know, your sales targets or your, competitive, your customer information and things like that, uh, you want to be uh, very, very careful. Okay, that is, that is one side. Yeah. Whatever you are putting that those uh, messages. What about the privacy issue? Uh, so like the data, what I'm having, uh, holding on my phone, right. or my location. Right? So, <coughs> no, so that's a good point. I think, uh, you know, there are, a new, uh, maybe I'll send you a reference later, but there are new tools that are coming up, also for what's called MDA, mobile device management, okay? So a common problem is people lose devices, right? You're traveling, you forgot the device, left it in a plane, there's a lot of important information. So a simple thing like a remote kill switch, which means it wipes out the device remotely. Right? So the administrator can do that and just kind of kill the device. That's one possibility. Or uh, talk about privacy, right? A lot of people, a lot of us, right? We use the same phone for a business use and a personal use. Okay? And I don't want my company to know who else I'm calling for personal purposes, right? But if I'm calling for business purposes, I want that to be expensed. So think about that, right? You're using the same plan and the same service, but you're using it for business use and personal use, and you don't want to share it, but you want to expense the business thing and keep the other stuff private. So there are tools uh, for, for that as well, uh, because, you know, so there's this huge trend called BYOD, if you've heard of it, bring your own device. Uh, so as more and more people are coming into the enterprise with their own device, uh, and using it for both, I mean, the line between personal and professional is blurring, right? I mean, we carry these devices, so you're always working, or at least you're always connected by email. And if something comes up, if it's urgent, you may even respond to it while you're at home, right? So these days, people are responding to work emails at home, and then they're shopping at work, right? I mean, just both, both the boundaries are kind of blurring, so you need, uh, so there are tools that are emerging for uh, these things as well. For, so in particular, mobile device management and uh, ensuring privacy and separation between your personal and professional. Just to add to that, uh, you know, no matter what you do, uh, there is a huge chance that your information will be, uh, you know, compromised. Uh, Snapchat, pretty popular in the US, uh, their entire database was compromised. Right. Blue Collar, which I think most of you guys might be using, their entire database has been compromised. So, you know, you can do only a certain amount of, uh, you can put in only a certain amount of effort, after which, uh, you know, you just can't do much. But nonetheless, right, it's kind of locks and security. I mean, if you make it hard for people to get in, I mean, that's the best you can do. So, uh, yeah, but these guys are well-funded, billion-dollar companies that you know, were not able to protect their own data. I mean, I'm talking right. about, uh, let's say, even Sony PlayStation. Uh, their, everybody's data was compromised at one point or the other. The problem is there are enough charts out there uh, ready to uh, you know cap uh, take up your data, uh, but you know going beyond a reasonable amount, putting more beyond a reasonable amount of effort in protecting your data would uh, take up too, too much of your resources. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I have a question. Uh, in terms of this enterprise market, now many of the tools which you spoke about, like say task management, project management, or the internal productivity improvement. Uh, where do you see the trend moving? Is it moving more towards standardization, where uh, when you know where there will be one popular tool which will be used by more and more enterprises, or it will go more towards customization, where the platform, but every company is trying to do it. I'm talking about larger size enterprise. No, I think <coughs> uh, you know, in, in all my experience in these every business, every enterprise has its own workflows, okay, and have their own processes which are custom to their businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to standardize between, I don't know, a manufacturing business and a retail business and a consumer <coughs> goods company and uh, a financial services company, right? So they've evolved their processes and and people are people and they do what's convenient or comfortable. Whatever. So I think, so the right answer is, you know, you need a tool that can be flexible. You think about, I don't know, SAP or Oracle. I mean, they're both, there's a standard product that comes out of the box, but there's a lot of customization you can do, right? So is it standard, is it customized? Well, it's both. I mean, it's, it is only <coughs> standard across enterprises, but, but each one can customize themselves. And that's a challenge, even in our own experience with TeamChat, I mean, we're seeing that. So, so there, in fact, you know, by definition, we created a product that could be trivially customized, as in, the, the, the ability to create new things is already built into the product. So when somebody asks for customization, it doesn't take us another six months to develop it. It, just, it takes us you know, maybe five minutes to configure it differently and then it just comes out. Right? But I think anybody who's building enterprise tools will have to anticipate a lot of flexibility, build in a lot of flexibility in the architecture itself. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, most of the apps that we are all aware use the internet as a uh, medium of communication. But there could be possibilities where some of my audience is not covered by internet. Right, right. So is the, are there uh, such apps which can use the dual channels, possibly the channel by SMS or also the internet, depending on what's available the other side, right. to communicate on the user? No, the that's, same. A good e <coughs> that's a good example, right? So at least uh, with uh, <coughs> some of the companies, you know, we, we combine both SMS and data, right? Uh, so on the same. Or in the same service, let's say if you're sending transactional messages, if you if you are signed up on that WhatsApp thing, then they would receive the message on WhatsApp. If not, then they'd receive it by SMS, right? So in a way, you, you just wherever possible you save cost and have more engagement. But if they don't have that, you still want your message to go through because you're required by law to send it. So then it goes by SMS. Um, I think it's becoming less and less of an issue. I mean. You know, maybe for a little bit of a period. Um, I, what I'd say is, I think if you're going for reach right now, I think SMS is still late because in IP messaging, there's no simple way to send a marketing message. I mean, it's really hard to do. Then you, all you can do is Facebook, Twitter, or maybe all those app marketing tools which we were talking about. Maybe the targeting is limited. So if you have a specific customer database, uh, you know, using it through SMS or uh, creating social media. Communities around your products is the best way. Yeah, uh, actually, I want to refer to your earlier point in terms of uh, the timing of developing an app. As you said, you know, and that's very helpful for me uh, in terms of understanding, you know, what where I should focus my energies on. So, in terms of, you know, what I got from it was that it has to be already an established brand, where you have to be very niche, that you're filling a huge market need to be able to develop an app. Um, but in the interim, to be able to develop, I mean, sort of leverage the mobile platform, are there any other things out there other than your website being responsive and being able to open on all these platforms? Is there anywhere something that's, you know, that you can do up for your website so you're not building an app, but you're just enabling people to access the website anywhere? I mean, no, is there anything other than responsive? No, sure. So I think, <coughs> see, not, you're right. Not building an app doesn't mean you don't use mobile as a marketing right. engine, right? So you can use it as a way to drive traffic mm -hmm. to the website. And once it's responsive, it still works on any mobile device. Right. You can get the transactions done. It's just that they may not download that specific app because if you use it just once a month, yeah, nobody, yeah. the only apps that people download are kind of daily use apps that you use five times a day. Right. And certain products are just not like that. Right. Right? They're, they're, they're not uh, daily use or multi daily use. So then the answer is certainly, I mean, you, you use it, think of it as a as a traffic driver mm -hmm. to the website. And, uh, you know, there, I mean, whether it's social media, <coughs> SMS, 
um, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's other communities you create. So you use that for messaging, for engagement, for communication, okay. for the promotions, and each of those has a link which okay. leads right back to your website. And so long as it's responsive, it works. Okay. So, so there's no other technology out there that somewhat you know helps your website um, kind of work better other than this responsive design aspect. Yeah, I think some websites uh, make a, a, a smaller strip down version of their website because you don't want too much uh, okay. data available. I mean, the suggestion is uh, you, you might want to look at HTML5. Okay, uh, HTML5 apps actually bridge the gap between uh, they almost look like and behave like real apps. Okay, but there's nothing downloaded on the device. It's okay. it's actually just a website. So so responsive just means you know you, it's a it's a standard website that also renders in a lower in a smaller screen format. Okay. But HTML5 actually just looks and behaves like an app. It takes over the whole screen, so it doesn't look like it's in a browser. It takes over the whole screen, and uh, you can even put a, a little uh, you know like the app icon on the on the device top. Okay. But all it is is a is a bookmark. Right, right. So HTML5 is more recommended compared to native apps. Just banned off. Is there something called strapping, or what is it called? No, so okay, you're asking about native apps versus hybrid or uh, HTML5 apps. See, I think uh, you know the answer. It sort of depends on the specific app and the specific <coughs> devices and so on. But in general, uh, native apps are much more. Uh, uh, they have a much better user experience. They're much more responsive, as in they, they click. Uh, you know, it, it just feels very seamless. Uh, but it's very expensive to develop, expensive to maintain, upgrade over time. Plus the problem of people downloading in the first place, right? HTML5. It's a lot easier. It has all the benefits. It's only in the. It's only on the website. You can update it on the fly. You can continuously do it, and it looks uh, as good as as an app for most things. So the simple answer is, if you're building. Uh, you know, if it's if it's a if let's say if it's an advanced game that really depends on high-end graphics and interactivity, then you want it to be native. If it is sort of a simpler service, uh, HTML5 is very good, very adequate. Uh, cross-platform. And, and it's yeah, clearly cross-platform. In fact, one tool one tool I'll suggest for guys who want to build apps, I mean, check out uh, Xamarin, which is spelled with an X, so X A M A R I N, which is a cross-platform development tool. So you, you in fact, develop it in .NET. Uh, it's easier. X-A-M-A-R-I-N. Uh, you develop it in .NET, but it produces native code for iOS, for Android, um, just as easily. So it's just easier. Uh, you know. Phonegap is also good. Titanium. No, Phonegap and Titanium were the earlier versions. I think Xamarin is becoming the new standard <laughs> in terms of sort of, sort of the latest um, Probably the best, I think. X A M A R I N. And and the other advantage is it's actually .NET programming, so it's easier to find, you know, maybe .NET developers uh, than it is to find an iOS developer or an Android developer. Or and certainly in Bombay, I mean, we've had challenges also hiring developers. Yeah. To what extent HTML5 apps would work when you're offline? They won't. They won't. Right? Yeah. That is one uh, disadvantage. But I, you no, know, you can just cache the thing. There's no, you can. But I, <laughs> yeah, but I think I, I won't worry about that. Look, you know, solve for the 90-10 or 80-20 use case. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't worry about that. You know, come. So, what are your views on and experiences with paid apps, in app purchasing, and in app advertising? I mean, that's a very general question. I think it depends. It really depends on what it is in the product, right? Firstly, to make anything pay. The bar is so high because there's so many good free uh, apps and games and so on available uh, that if you're going to make something paid, it better be really compelling. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, I think again, it depends on what it is. But if people can try before you buy, you know, and that's what in-app purchasing does, where you or, or freemium pricing models. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's better. Because oftentimes, you know, if people see a price tag, they may just turn it off and don't even look at it. So, so unless it has some, see, if the value has to be clear, right? Like, I say somebody was talking about U.S. legal documents and so on. If I'm a lawyer and I need those documents and it's very clear what it is, 
and I don't mind paying upfront and then getting it and using it. Okay, but if it's something where you're offering something new, I've never tried it. I don't even know if I need it. Then you're better off doing it as premium, which is okay. Try it for a week or try it, you know, for a closer limited service. And then if you want more of it, you can pay for it. Yes. Uh, uh, after this adoption of mobile, especially in enterprises, there's a lot of uh, a lot of data which earlier was not available is now getting captured, like right. your geolocations of sales people and stuff. Absolutely. Like so how do you, uh, how do you, uh, how should I, what, what should an enterprise do to extract maximum value out of it? In no, terms of a, analytics and stuff, right. are there, what is the type of approach? No, that's right. a great question. In fact, let me uh, touch on this theme and uh, we're seeing that in our uh, team chat experience as well, right? All of, the, all of us carrying mobile devices, okay? Everything that can be recorded and then tracked and measured will eventually get tracked and measured, right? It could be the location of a person at, at any time or, uh, you know, the calls. And, and of course, there are privacy issues. So let me, let me just leave that aside for a second. Let's assume that, you know, this is with, with the employee's consent, right? Uh, and if it's a business visit, uh, you know, if the, if the salesperson was supposed to visit four customers during the day, he should have no problem being, you know, checking in and reporting that he was at this time at this location and then the next location and so on and so forth. Or if he had to make so many calls, I'm assuming he'd have no problem being recorded when these calls are made, right? In a BPO, you do that all the time. So, so whether it's calls made or places visited or uh -huh. messages sent or conversations had, um, or you know, could be your blood pressure and temperature and other things as well. Uh, all of those things are going to get measured and, and get tracked and then correlated. So in, a, in some sense, uh, I mean, how to do it, it, it sort of, it depends on what business you're in and what you want to do with the data and so on. Uh, but that's also one of the reasons why, right, there's this huge trend in another field called big data, right? As because there's such an explosion of data. Uh, with, with Google Glass, for example, you can just record, you can take a live video recording of everything you're doing. Imagine you can have you know terabytes of videos generated by all your employees all the time constantly. Now who's going to analyze? Who's going to study it? And so on. So I think it, it really depends on what the data is and what you have to do. But but what I might suggest is start with the obvious, with the simple, with the with the, with the essential thing, right? If, if you're a I don't know a pharmaceutical company where the MR visiting the doctors and a certain yeah. set of pharmacies is important, then tracking that and measuring that is important, right? If if you have salespeople who have to do visit a certain number of miles or certain kilometers every day and so on. Track that, capture it, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it's absolutely uh, essential that the, the ability to have, in fact, in all my conferences, right, you talk to like say ICIC or HDFC, they say, today we have like a lack of people in the field, we have no idea, okay, or rather very little idea what they're doing. All we see are the sales people. But I have no idea if they're happy, motivated, like the product, don't like the product, change, competitive. We have no feedback coming back from the field. And suddenly, once, once they have all these smart devices, you have GPS, you have location, you have the comments, the opinions, the votes, the responses, the recommendations, all coming in. And you know, for the first time, I mean, it's almost like these companies are flying blind. Okay. Uh, and they, they change certain things and a month later something happens and then you say, okay, it happened because of this and you think you know what happened. But now it's just much more powerful. So do you see any business opportunities there? Sorry, that's a follow-up question. Yeah, so I think uh, absolutely. I mean, as a service provider. Mm -hmm. So creating tools that automatically capture stuff. I mean, there are, let's like say there are some expense tracking tools that automatically track your mileage, okay, which is, in, at least in the US, you get paid per kilometer or per mile, right? And it's really a big pay. So if you have an app which just tracks all your trips, and at the end of the month, you can just say, okay, well, this was a personal trip to the grocery store, so forget that. For all the other trips, it says, here's your office location, here's the customer location, here was the number of miles, and here, here are the fuel stops you made. Then, it just, then, you know, data entry problem goes away because the data entry is automatic. So it becomes much more usable, simpler, and very powerful. Yeah. Do you think the BLE or Bluetooth or Nigeria? Uh, revolutionize uh, location-based marketing. I see what beacons and uh, I'm sorry, what NFC, Bluetooth low energy BLE. You know, like estimate beacons. You put them on the retail stores and you can control micro location-based. Uh, uh, you know, I struggle with that, and that because the range is so limited. We have I mean, Bluetooth has been around for I don't know a decade, maybe more. 
and people have talked about this, or even NFC, right? Near field communication is something right. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but because Bluetooth, I mean, it's permission based, so I have to accept something before I do. I mean, it's too complicated. No, no, yeah. but they I mean, are you aware of ST modes? No, I that. Okay, those are like beacons, you know, I beacon on iPhone. Right. No, you also have these, uh, what are called, uh, you know, high frequency sound beacons as well, which you can use on the devices. Right. That are because these you can get for 60, uh, you can get three of them for 60 bucks. You put it in your retail store. Right. And it covers, you know, to a micro location base, you know, where the shelf is. No, the problem, okay, uh, the only thing I'll say is, the problem is that if something works just in a very narrow location, Right. How do you get the customer to download an app that interfaces with that? So that that's what it's you cover a mall, for example, and as they walk in, depending on where they are, no, they but even then, I mean, okay, how does one mall influence a customer to download an app? Because I visit no, it's not an app. It's, it's going to be a location based marketing, like for the vision behind Apple. Right. Is that, you know, on your uh, screen, you know, you'll, as you walk in a mall, depending on where you are, because of the beacons, you'll be able to get the targeted uh, ads based on where you are. Sure. And so let's let's talk offline. I think my view is I've, I've seen, in fact, many companies with business plans relying around some of these things. So unless Apple or Google in, insert something into the into the device right. that makes it a standard, if, if it has to be a standalone app, it's, the issue is just getting the, the so network effects going. In. So they have the tool. You, you, you have the coordinates, and then like, the app can get the coordinates of the beacon. Right. Yeah. What valuation can create for Indian company to promote or sell uh, their apps, their paid apps to Indian entity uh, instead of the foreign entity? Because when we sell something from an Indian entity, then definitely the tax we have to uh, tax will be additionally cost. Example in my side, example we want to do something launch for the B two C segment for the voice IV, so at least the twenty two percent tax, like eight percent for DOT and twelve percent service tax. Like we have a challenge is like foreign. Uh, voice services has so much popular in India because uh, definitely cost is down. So, uh, is there any valuation create uh, for Indian company, uh, uh, you know, to promoting their apps through Indian entity instead of overseas entity? If you win the customer, then there is a. I think that's probably a very specific question uh, to to EOIP because I think. Yeah. I think that's. I just before uh, so yesterday I just signed up for browse services and see that if you uh, you can also offer your same services from a US entity also. Right. And currently now you're offering from Indian entities, so you're charging service tax is, is extra. So it's additional to the customers. Right. So uh, is what valuation can be added uh, for future for the company? It's I think I would just say look, I mean, you know, make it simple for the customer is what I'd say, which means. Make a single standard price, mm -hmm. and then just average it out. Meaning, if you say on average, 50% of my customers are in India and 50% outside, right? Then you just you don't have differential pricing in different places. I mean, just have it standard and just say, okay, it's the cost of doing business. Right? Uh, anyway, let's talk about. I mean, that's a very specific instance. I mean, maybe maybe there are other ways to structure it. Yeah. Any specific ways you can uh, discuss to increase? Uh, the value or conversions on SMS marketing? Any few ideas on that? Yeah, I think uh, I mean, we've done this a lot, and uh, it will depend on the specific instances. But in general, I'd say uh, you know the, the 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 text, the copy of the text is very very important. The message has to be very clear and simple uh, in ways that understand. I'll give you an example, right? Somebody was uh, promoting, let's say, books, and they said, okay, you know, the, you know. These two, <coughs> Uh, the names of the best sellers and it's uh, for you know 700 rupees or something and apparently it was a very good deal. They sent that campaign and it done, didn't work very well, right? But uh, replacing the book name with the author name which is more recognizable sure. improved conversion. Replacing 700 rupees by saying you know 85% off also improved it uh, dramatically. Right? Uh, then instead of uh, putting the brand name, right, it was actually a well-known branded company, but they weren't mentioning it in the message. Okay. Suddenly that builds trust, saying it's not a fake offer, it's a real offer. So these are, uh, you know, just these are different, and then of course targeting, are you targeting the right audience? Uh, who are you sending the message to? Have they done transactions before? Uh, also, what is the response mechanism? Maybe missed calls tend to have a higher response than an SMS response, right? But if you do this call, then you have a call back right away to set up the mechanism. So there's a variety of different factors to, to, to do it right, to do it well.
a very basic thing to what you just said, uh, SMS marketing. I have very three very basic questions. Is it legally valid? Valid. Second, is it ethical? And third, is does it adversely affect your organization's reputation? Well, I, I, I yeah. No, good, good questions. Is it uh, legal? Well, Tri has, uh, you know, the telecom regulatory, the regulatory authority has defined rules on who you can send messages to and who you cannot. So there is a do not disturb list to whom you can't send messages, while to others you can. So that's as far as law is concerned. As far as uh, ethical, I mean, uh, you know, and, and does it damage your brand? The answer to that, actually, I mean, that's a, that's a very important and a, and a good question. And the answer is if you do it right, uh, and right not just for yourself, but for the customer, then yes, it's ethical and help doesn't damage your brand. But if you do it wrong, then certainly it can help. And what I mean by that is, you know, the better the targeting is, the better the value is, and people understand, right? I mean, we all understand that advertising is important. You see it all around. You see a free cricket match, but it comes with ads. Are you upset that there are ads? No. Well, maybe, you know, maybe you should pay for it, then, right? Or you get the newspaper, but it comes with ads. You get a magazine, it comes with ads. So, I think we are all sensitized to the fact that advertising is going to be there. But if it's excessive, if it is irrelevant, you know, I, if I don't have a kid, why are you selling me diapers? I mean, it doesn't make sense. Right? So, if it's irrelevant ads, then they become annoying and so on. So I think with better targeting, with good value, with good offers and good messages, um, it can be very effective. So in terms of uh, uh, filtering out those irrelevant ads, is there some uh, way in which uh, customers can decide that they want a certain sector of ad? Uh, because I had some personal experiences of where I was bombarded with a lot of irrelevant ads and I signed up with the AG. Right. Uh, but it no. could be that I'm interested in a particular sector. Maybe that's a good opportunity for an app. Yeah. So there are uh, there are apps I've seen that take over your SMS inbox, okay, and control the messages that come in, or right. maybe organize them and so on. Right. Uh, but it hasn't been a certainly not a global standard. Uh, maybe uh, yeah. No, but it has to come from Tri, right? That, uh, uh, it is opening gateway to a certain sector. Or I know, but something there is like DAT one, two, three, whatever. Yeah. Stores. No, but so if you want financial services, choose one. So we work very closely with Tri. To have a, uh, let me leave it at it's. It's really hard to have a very rational and logical conversation with Tri. Yeah. For them, it's kind of very. It's all black and white. There are no grays. Exactly. And what you're asking about is one of those gray. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Okay. Any more questions? I think we're really good on time today. <laughs> you had a very good audience here today. Uh, good discussion. Numbers, uh, I think the I think all of you will agree there's a lot of notes that we all have taken personally, which we will go back and apply to our own businesses. And um, you know, all of this will be uploaded. I hope you don't mind. Uh, you know, our sessions are available. <laughs> 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 so, very fast, you want to edit, let us know now. <laughs> so, me, me talking about regulators? <laughs> yes, so we can edit those sections, maybe. <laughs> um, and I think this has been brilliant. Uh, thank you so much well, on behalf of Thai uh, and uh, behalf of all our audience. This is a small token which we oh. typically make a contribution towards some of these NGOs okay. on behalf of our speakers. Great. So Thank there you. are some NGOs that do work with uh, you know education for children and kids and uh, women.